the oil question here on the North Slope is tricky business. Since 1961, an Alaska Department of Natural Resources geologist named Tom Marshall had pressed for the state to select over 1.5 million acres of North Slope tundra as part of the 103 million acres promised to Alaska as part of the 1958 Statehood Act. Three years later, in 1964, the state approved of Marshall's idea. Now, most people in the department and in the Bureau of Land Management and most politicians, and even the oil companies, balked, dubbing Marshall's North Slope selection Marshall's Folly, where have I heard that before, or Marshall's Icebox. When later a handful of oil companies tried to lease some of that acreage, specifically several tens of thousands of acres offshore in Prudhoe Bay, where I am, the governor, William Egan, refused. See, a native Alaskan group, the Arctic Slope Native Association, had filed a lawsuit claiming North Slope land as the ancestral land of the Inupiat people. Well, thanks to the association's claim, only one solitary well was planned for the entire North Slope. This is 1966. Before the year was out, however, a gubernatorial election saw William Egan booted out, and the new governor, Walter Hickel, who'd been involved in the oil business before, he saw things very differently than his predecessor. Almost immediately, Hickel offered the Prudhoe Bay parcels in a special oil and gas lease sale. His thinking was more complicated than might initially be assumed. Yes, he wanted to help the oil companies, but he also calculated that by allowing the lease sale to go on, he'd force the courts and the legislators, who seemed to have been dragging on this, to make a move when it came to some sort of native land claim solution. In fact, when he met with native Alaskan leaders to hash out the issue, he was able to convince them that it was in their best interest not to oppose the sale. As incentive, he promised to support them in their claims against the federal government. In addition, of course, should oil be forthcoming, oil money would be forthcoming, and that would benefit the local North Slope communities. Well, Atlantic Richfield, or ARCO, BP and Exxon all placed bids on the Prudhoe Bay oil lease sale. By April 1967, ARCO was drilling in Prudhoe Bay, and after a summer halt, drilling continued in November. A month later, ARCO struck gas, which the company made public in January. By February, ARCO had struck oil, too, and by March, the oil well was producing over a thousand barrels a day. Well, hundreds of VIPs, we're talking company executives, politicians, UN reps, reporters, now made their way here to Prudhoe Bay to be briefed on the developing find. By the summer, a second Arco well, with the capacity to produce over 3,500 barrels of oil a day, was announced. Weeks later, the numbers were being adjusted. Now Arco was claiming that between their two wells, they could produce a whopping 20,000 to 30,000 barrels a day. Now, if this was true, it was Middle East level production. It seemed Alaska's North Slope was home to the largest oil field in North America, and thus one of the world's great oil fields. Arco wasn't lying. Independent geologists subsequently estimated the Prudhoe Bay field to contain over 20 billion barrels of oil, plus almost 40 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. By the end of 1968, more than a dozen oil companies were active in and around Prudhoe Bay. When the state of Alaska organized a lease auction the next year, it raked in almost a billion dollars. But it was one thing to get a bunch of crude oil out of the ground on the Arctic coast, it's quite another to get it to markets hundreds of miles away or thousands of miles away, far to the south. But the oil fields in the Arctic here in northern Alaska promised so much wealth that several private business entities got together and, as a consortium under the name Alyeska Pipeline Company, made plans for an oil pipeline that would completely bisect the state of Alaska, running from Prudhoe Bay south across the North Slope 
over the Brooks Range, where I am, through Alaska's daunting interior, including, you know, you'd have to cross hundreds of rivers and streams, over the mountains of the south, and then end up at the ice-free port of Valdez, where it could be shipped in tankers where it needed to go. In the end, the pipeline would prove to be the most expensive private undertaking in all of American history. The engineers of the pipeline would have to think about all sorts of things. Animal migrations, they'd have to think about earthquakes, they'd have to think about tectonic plates, they'd have to think about permafrost. All of this would have to be taken into account as the design of the pipeline uh, was produced. In fact, during the summer, the pipeline actually expands five miles. It becomes five miles longer, and then it contracts five miles worth during the winter. And it, it zigzags, you know, in, in order to account for this. But the consortium's biggest problem wasn't any of these things. See, they wanted to start building right away, 1969. But the plans came up against the land claims of indigenous Alaskans. This major legal obstacle paused work on the pipeline through all of 1969, then through all of 1970, then 1971. In 1972, however, world events unwittingly helped the Alyeska Pipeline Company. On the other side of the world, OPEC, made up mostly of Arab oil producing companies, enraged at U.S. support of Israel during the Yom Kippur War, launched an oil embargo on the United States. This period was marked by gas shortages and across the country, long lines at the pump. For Americans, the experience was alarming. Could America be so easily brought to its knees by the Middle East's oil producers? The need for an alternate source of oil seemed obvious, and Congress now prioritized pushing approval through for the Alaska pipeline. Construction began in 1974. Like the gold rushes or stampedes 75 years earlier, thousands and thousands of people now rushed to Alaska, specifically to Fairbanks, where the pipeline project was headquartered, to cash in on the $900 million or so the project was supposed to cost. Now, the actual cost turned out to be almost $8 billion. But in the summer of 1977, the first crude oil drilled in Prudhoe Bay, so just up this road, about four hours, very bumpy road, made its way 800 miles all the way across Alaska to Valdez. Hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil per day made their way through the pipeline. Then, eventually, a couple of million barrels per day by the late 1980s. Despite a subsequent oil glut on the market, the state of Alaska raked in millions in royalties. As always when it comes to government, more revenue meant more spending. But the state also created a trust fund, the Alaska Permanent Fund which would pay every Alaskan resident an annual dividend, typically worth something between one and $3,000. Petroleum was now the leading factor of the Alaskan economy. The oil question here on the North Slope is tricky business. See, on the one hand, there's the wealth that it generates. Even the native corporations, notably the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, this is an Inupiat Eskimo Corporation, have gotten in on the drilling and, you know, cashing in on oil, cashing in on the continued boom, hoping to find additional fields in the region, additional to Prudhoe Bay. But other groups, other natives, for example, some Athabascan native groups, plus environmentalist activists, have stood in the way. Drilling operations in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, or ANWR, for example, could disrupt caribou calving ground adversely affecting native peoples who still depend on the caribou. And there are other environmental issues as well. This issue, drilling in the north elsewhere, beyond Prudhoe Bay, stalled in Congress for years, despite the support of the Alaskan delegation in Congress. And then you got the Exxon Valdez or Exxon Valdez spill. And that only adds fuel to the fire. Well, President Donald Trump temporarily issued leases for drilling in Anwar. This is in 2021. 
But President Joe Biden immediately suspended and then later canceled all of the leases. So the question of drilling in Alaska's far north remains a contested one.